Book of Romans, chapter 1. We are in Romans today. Uh, the title of the series in Romans is The Problem Solved, as we learned last week, or as you could imagine. The problem that we experience in the world is sin. Uh, sin is a, a theological word. It simply means missing the mark, the mark of holiness and purity and perfection. Sin is the problem that we all experience. It's separation from God. When you are born, you come out crying. Every baby that has ever been born, usually if it's healthy, it's crying. Isn't that amazing? The separation from God. And uh, I'd like to look with you uh, at a message that I've entitled today, Let's Start with Faith. Let's start with faith. Join with me there. The book of Romans, chapter 1. I'll begin reading in verse 8. Uh, we'll read through verse 15. So Romans chapter 1, verse 8, it says, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers making request if by some means now at last I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift so that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Now I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you but was hindered until now, that I might have some fruit among you also just as among the other Gentiles. I am a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and to unwise. So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for your grace and your mercy. God, I want to thank you for giving us uh, the ability to get the radio station back on air. Thank you for that, Lord. We praise you and we honor you. We give you glory for that. I pray that that, that station would uh, really encourage people and lift people up and feed people in this community, maybe those that, that uh, are a little apprehensive or nervous to go to church, God, that they could still get fed your word by simply turning on their radio. They can grow spiritually, and we thank you for that, Lord. God, we thank you for Hope Coffee, and we thank you for our brothers and sisters all around the world, the, the coffee growers and the farmers, the people that are doing ministry in churches and orphanages and schools, and uh, that we can come alongside of them and partner with them, Lord, to see people saved and people encouraged. Lord, we're just really grateful to you uh, for that, God. Lord, our youth are up at camp. They're finishing their youth camp today, and uh, I pray for the work that you have done in their lives of these uh, teenagers, Father, that they would be godly men and women as they grow closer to you. Lord, may they, they learn more of you. May their, their faith be strengthened and encouraged and that they would do great things for your kingdom, Lord, in their generation. Lord, that they would lead the charge of following you, Lord. Fill them with your spirit and, and, uh, and help them, God. Keep them from evil, Lord. Protect them, Father. Thank you for Pastor Julio, his wife Wendy, their children. Lord, I pray uh, you'd give them great rest uh, after pouring out their lives uh, this weekend on the, into these kids, Lord. Bring them back safely, we pray. And Lord, as we, uh, oh Lord, let's also pray for the election that is, is just coming up, Father. We, we uh, pray that you would raise up the godly men and women. Uh, those that would love you, those that would take this role uh, seriously, that they would not be hungry for power, but that they would be men and women that are ruled by principle, Lord, of, of, uh, of serving and loving and doing a great job of, of uh, uh, promoting policies that are favorable, Lord, for families, favorable for um, freedom, favorable for your work. Uh, Lord, so we pray for this election, Lord. I pray that every one of us here within the sound of my voice that we would do our job and do our diligence to, uh, to vote. And uh, Lord, we just commit that to you, God. We, uh, we, pray, we thank you for this country and we pray that, that, uh, that the, the good things about this country would continue uh, to be such, Lord. Lord, we turn our attention now to the most important thing, Lord. 
uh, the, the thing that, that can just change us and help us, and that is your word, Lord. We are here because your word has spoken to us. I pray that as we look at this topic of faith today, uh, that you would strengthen our faith, each and every one of us, Lord, that we would be men and women that would walk by faith, not by sight. Lord, uh, for those here today that might not know you, that they may be living a life that's apart from you, God, would you reveal yourself to them today in a way that they cannot deny. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Do you believe? Two blind men were following Jesus. Jesus goes into a house and they follow him. Uh, before they went into that house, when they were outside, these blind men were, were, were crying out, Son of David, have mercy on us. Just, I'm sure, with, with, with desperation for their blindness. And so, so they follow Jesus into the house. And Jesus says to them, do you believe? Do you believe that I am able to do this? To do what? Well, to, to heal them, to open their eyes. And, and that's what they said. They said, yes, Lord. And then in Matthew's gospel, in, in chapter 9, Matthew says that Jesus touched their eyes and said, listen carefully, according to your faith, let it be to you. Another translation says, because of your faith, it will happen. And a miracle took place that day. Their eyes were opened, and they could see. Because of their faith, it will happen. If you've read the Bible for any length of time, if you've read about the life of Jesus, the teaching of Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, you've seen how he often calls people to believe. Have faith. Have faith. Oh, you have little faith, he says to some. He calls people to believe. According to your faith, it will happen. And so as we are looking at this letter to the Romans written by the Apostle Paul, after he, in the first seven verses, this introduction that we looked at last week, now as we look at these next verses, uh, he's talking about faith. He says first in verse 8, first, let's talk about your faith. First, I thank my God about your faith. And so today as we, as we look at this passage, it's a good idea and a good opportunity for us to take inventory of our faith. To, to do, uh, well, I don't know, a self-analysis of our faith, an inventory, if you will, of our faith. If you could look in the mirror and see a reflection of your faith, what would you see? So we're going to break this down this way. First, we're going to see that faith is essential. Second, faith means prayer. And third, faith should be dynamic. We'll explain all of this. But first, let's talk about this, faith is essential. So a typical ancient letter after the greeting, the author of the letter, and, and I love ancient letters because they start off with the sender, right? You see that, verse 1, the very first word, Paul. In, in a, that's not our custom today, right? If you were to write a handwritten letter, where do you put your name? All the way at the end, right? So you get kind of a crazy letter. You don't know who it's from. You have to look at the end to find out who it's from. Of course, with email, it's, it's not that way today. But, but in, in ancient times, they'd write the, the sender first, Paul. And then typically after this greeting, the author of the letter would express some pleasantries, some concern for their health or their, their general welfare. But Paul changes that up a little bit, and he starts off talking about their faith. He, he uh, expresses concern about their faith, or he, he makes note of their notable faith. He doesn't mention their position in so society. He doesn't mention their popularity on social media. He doesn't talk at all about their financial success, their career endeavors, their health, or their family. And all of those things could be important. But, but Paul mentions first their faith. And this word he's referring to their relationship with God, for this is how we relate to God, is by faith. You see, he's talking about their, their need for a deeper experience of God, this greater intimacy with Christ, this filling of the Spirit, so on and so on. So, so this is what he's talking about with faith. 
And for Paul, the most important thing about life centers on one's relationship with God through faith. Everything else is secondary. Because if you get the core right, this core of faith, if you get this right, it's going to make everything else in your life, it's going to put it into proper perspective, and it's going to be easier, if you will, uh, and it's going to make it better for you to deal with everything else if you get this right. And, and we might say that, that Paul calls their faith famous, right? Did you see that? It says, the end of verse 8, your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. So Paul had heard about what God was doing in Rome, and it brought joy to his heart. Faith is the most important aspect of who you are. It's the most important part of your life. Ronald Dunn said, faith is our chief duty and the fountain from which all other duties flow. You have nothing if you don't have faith. It's the essence of our relationship with God. And this is how we come to God, isn't it? We come to God by faith. Pastor Robert has a license plate on his vehicle, and it says uh, JHN. 112 if i'm not if i'm not mistaken that means john 1 12 john 1 12 which says this but as many as received him to them he gave the right to become children of god to those who believe in his name and leave that verse up there for a bit because you see there's there's two components to faith here so that that verse ends to those who believe in his name and that's typically what we think about faith this intellectual acknowledgement i believe. But there's also this other aspect of it as reception, right? I receive. So I receive Jesus and I believe in him. We're going to talk a bit more about faith, but this is how one becomes a Christian. I believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. This is, this is, it's not just signing your name on a statement of faith. I mean, you can do that, but if you don't really believe in your heart, if you don't really receive Jesus, you're not a Christian. Let me tell you about a young man named Subhan. Subhan was a Muslim enrolled in an Islamic school. And one day as he's walking home from class, he sees on the, on the ground there blowing in the wind a, a scrap piece of paper that he picks up. And it just so happened to be a page torn out of Matthew's gospel. And Subhan begins to read it. It's, it's describing the, the death of Jesus, the crucifixion of Jesus. And he read this line. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that impressed his heart. And he read it over and over again. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? See, he had been taught, as most Muslims are, that it really was not Jesus that was crucified, but rather it was Judas who accepted in some fashion Christ's likeness. And so Judas died on the cross and then Jesus ascended to heaven before the crucifixion. But as he read this sentence over and over again, he realized these are not the words of Judas, for these are not the words of an evil man. These are the words of a good man, because only a good man would ask, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You see, an evil man would understand why God would forsake him. And so, so he knew, Subhan did, that Christ died for him, and he accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior. Well, the story goes on. I don't have time to, to go into all of the other details, but, but he told his friends, and his friends told his teacher. He ended up getting kicked out of that school and having to leave the country. And, and uh, I'm sure you've heard many stories like this. And brothers and sisters, I, I think that we need to familiarize ourselves more and more with the lives of Christians who live in countries and under situations of great persecution because it will inspire us that if we ever have to face these type of things, that we will be prepared and know that we're not alone. Subhan exercised faith, and he came to Christ. All his outside circumstances stayed the same, but it was this internal reception of Jesus, this internal belief in Christ. One day, Jesus was eating at the home of a religious leader, a Pharisee. And a woman in the city, and let's just say this woman was of not of good reputation. She had a bad reputation. And she came in carrying a jar of expensive oil. And the woman was weeping, emotionally moved, because she was in the presence of this person that she knew could, um, could change her life as she would repent. She, she understood this. And so she's emotionally moved. She's weeping. 
Her life is greatly affected by the presence of Jesus. And the Bible says that she washed Jesus' feet with her tears. So you could imagine she's down there and she's just crying so much. And she's, she's washing his feet. She wipes them, the Bible says. She's wiping them with her hair. She kisses his feet. She anoints his feet with this fragrant oil, which would be a large financial sacrifice for this lady. And, and to us in this culture, this seems a little weird, right? That, that we, we never see things like this. But in that culture... This would have been a, a supreme sign of respect and submission and honor and affection for this, this rabbi. She was motivated by this repentance and her life change. And then in Luke 7, 47, Jesus says to his host, uh, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. And then in Luke 7, 50, he says to the woman, your faith has saved you. Your faith has saved you. So there is this saving faith that most, if not all of us in this room, have taken that step of faith. We've believed in Jesus and we're Christians. We walk with Jesus because at one point in our life, maybe it was a long time ago, maybe it was a short time ago, but we exercised faith and we believed in Jesus. But beyond saving faith as Christians, we can define faith as a constant outlook of trust and dependence toward God. A constant outlook of trust and dependence toward God. It, it's this life of reliance, relying continually. Now, it's not just, as I mentioned earlier, it's not just believing in God. Uh, do you know that demons believe in God? James 2.19, uh, you believe there's one God, you do well. But even the demons believe and tremble. And so, so we can't just say, oh, do you believe in God? Yes. Okay, you're a Christian. No, 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 no. So, so true biblical faith is trusting God. It's relying upon God. Hebrews 11.1 1 says that faith is confidence in what we hope for. Faith is assurance about what we do not see. Listen, faith is our life. Faith is our lifestyle. Faith is how we relate to God. I think of it this way. Faith connects us with the spiritual realm, right? You know there's a spiritual realm. We, we know there's angels and demons, God, the devil. There's, there's a whole spiritual realm. And faith takes us into that realm, if you will. This is how we live. Uh, John Blanchard wrote this. Without faith, it would be impossible for us to live in a meaningful way. Faith is the engine driving all the actions. One of my favorite verses about faith is found in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 11.6. It says, without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is or must believe that he exists and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Do you believe that God exists? Do you believe that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him? I think this is my favorite verse about faith because it promises a reward if I diligently seek God. Do you want a reward from God? I mean, come on. Do you want a reward? I mean, what, what greater reward could that be? Diligently seek the Lord. If you want to please God, have faith. Believe. God rewards those who diligently seek him. When was the last time? Now, really, think about this. Let's do a little self-evaluation. When was the last time you diligently sought the Lord? Now, if you're like me and you've, well, I, I came to know the Lord when I was, I don't know, maybe 16 or 17. I'm in my 50s now, so that means that I've known the Lord maybe like 40 years. My goodness, <laughs> that's a long time. And so if you're like me and you've walked with the Lord for a number of years, you know that well, you can get a little complacent, can't you? You just kind of put it in cruise control. In my car now, uh, maybe if you have a newer car, it, it also, it sort of steers for you. Have you ever driven a car like that? Right? So, so now I can literally put it in cruise control, take my hands off the wheel. Hey, I'm good. Now, in the after, after about, you know, five seconds or ten seconds, it's like, please put your hands on the steering wheel or whatever. So it even knows where my hands are, which is a little weird little creepy, but, um, but we can do that in our Christian life, right? We can just kind of put it in cruise control and sit back and, and just, I'm just, you know, 
doesn't really matter. I know God's going to watch out for me. I'm good. And, and we're not doing anything by faith. In fact, this is one of the reasons why years ago I decided to move to Toronto. Because I looked at my life. I had a great job working for a big church. My kids were going to Christian school. All our bills were paid. And, and, and of course, there were a number of other factors went into this. But one of them was my faith. I'm thinking, like, what am I doing that requires faith right now? Got a good job good marriage my kids i mean everything seems to be like what am i doing that requires faith and i just started doing a little evaluation and then that you know among that then we said okay let's uh let's give it all up (laughs) and move to another country which not saying that you know that's what god's telling you to do by any means um but but the point is diligently seeking god this is essential for your life diligently seeking the lord This brings us to our next point. Faith means prayer. Faith means prayer. Not sure if you've ever thought of that, but look at verse 9, where Paul says, God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. I love the NLT here, which says, God knows how often, and NLT is the New Living Translation, just a different translation of the Bible. Sometimes it's helpful to look at different translations, rephrases things a little bit. They all go back to the original language, so it's, it's not wrong to read different translations. Uh, unless, well, the New World Translation is a really bad translation. Don't ever read that one. But uh, God knows how often I pray for you. Day and night I bring you and your needs in prayer to God. And so, so this, is, this is Paul saying to the Roman church, this, this, this church that he had never met, the people there he had never met, but he knew some people there. We see that when we get to the end of the book as he's sending all these greetings here. But Paul certainly was a man of faith. And he prayed for the church in Rome. This is fascinating. He'd never been there. He's heard a lot about them, and he prays for them. He was connecting with God around the world through prayer. And it's really a beautiful reality that you can be part of what God is doing all over the world through your prayers. Paul wasn't in Rome. He wanted to go. We see that here in these verses. He wanted to go. So what does he do? He prays. He starts praying for them. And then he writes them a letter. And then finally, the Lord opened up a door for him to go. In verse 9, he says he prayed day and night for the needs of the church. He did the same for the church in Philippi. Philippians 1, verse 3 and 4. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy. Ephesians chapter 1. Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Colossians 1, 3. We give thanks to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith and your love. Do you get a glimpse of how Paul spent his time? He's a man of prayer. It was a man of prayer. Now, here's the point. The vibrancy of your faith will be reflected in the vibrancy of your prayers. Much prayer, much faith. Could I be so bold to say little prayer, little faith? E.M. Bounds, in his classic book, The Necessity of Prayer, writes this. In the ultimate issue, prayer is simply faith. Claiming its natural yet marvelous prerogatives. Faith taking possession of its inheritance. When faith ceases to pray, it ceases to live. So if you've gotten to a point in your life where you stopped praying, is your faith dead? How's your faith? When faith ceases to pray, faith ceases to live. And Paul's faith is alive because his prayer life is alive. You could say it this way. Prayer is a gauge that measures our faith. We all have gauges on our car, or if you work with different equipment, right, maybe in some type of factory or or different types of uh, craft and metal and all of that, that there's gauges on instruments to make sure things are at the right pressure, things are at the right speed, things are at the right temperature. So the gauge of your faith is prayer. Andrew Murray wrote a classic book on prayer called With Christ in the School of Prayer. And a quote from that book says this, Faith needs a life of prayer for its full growth. Faith needs a life of prayer for its full growth. So, 
I know uh, that some of you may feel convicted right now because you're thinking, man, my prayer life is really lousy. And he just said that I have weak or dead faith because my prayer life is lousy. Listen, this is an encouragement because if you want your faith to get stronger, pray. Right? So this is, this is more like a recipe. So don't look back. Look forward. If you, if you feel like your faith is weak, and, and I, I think if we were to do a survey right now, and there's a, a lot of you have walked with the Lord for many, many years. And I think if, if we were to do a survey, we could say that, that most godly people, most people that have walked with the Lord have gone through seasons of prayerlessness, right? You've gone through seasons maybe of, of lack of prayer here and there, right? And so I don't want anybody to feel convicted, but I want you to feel inspired to pray. And now it doesn't have to be some fancy or long prayer. Have you ever heard testimonies from people? Well, I was at 4 o'clock this morning. The Lord brought you to my mind as I was praying. And you're like, at 4 o'clock in the morning, I was dreaming <laughs> about myself or whatever. And you feel so convicted because these people that maybe get up so early or they spend, you know, three hours in prayer, they spend all night in prayer. You don't have to do that. May the Lord, may the Lord help you to do that. I mean, there's nothing wrong. I mean, obviously, there's nothing wrong with that. But you could just open your Bible to a psalm and just prayerfully read a psalm. Psalm 3, verse 1, Lord, how have they increased that trouble me? Many are those who rise up against me. Many are they who say of me, there's no help for him in God. But you, O oh Lord, are a shield about me. You are my glory. You are the one who lifts my head. And you're just reading a psalm and praying, even if it's just a few moments that can inspire your prayer life. What about Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 through 13, our Father who art in heaven? I mean, Jesus said, when you pray, say these words. When was the last time you prayed that prayer? Oh, no, that's for uh, Catholicism. No, no, it's in the Bible. <laughs> Jesus told his disciples, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. This is how you pray. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And so begin praying and watch your faith grow. So faith is essential. Faith means prayer. Uh, lastly, uh, faith should be dynamic. Look at, verse, look at verse 11 where Paul says, For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift so that you may be established. That is, I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith both of you and me. I do not want you to be unaware, brethren. I often plan to come to you. And then he goes on to talk about his desire to come. But what I notice in, in these verses is that Paul was expecting his faith to encourage them, but he was also expecting their faith to encourage him. He wanted to visit Rome. He knew that he could encourage them. He wanted to preach the gospel there. He wanted, uh, he wanted to encourage the church. Paul had this heart of encouragement everywhere he went, just trying to encourage, helping people grow. Uh, and so I, I wrote this down in my notes here. Your faith affects me, and my faith affects you. Your faith affects me, my faith affects you. Now, how, how does that play out? How did it play out for, for Paul? What, what is Paul thinking when he, when he gets to Rome? What, are, what, what would he do when he got to Rome? Well, thankful for the Bible. Uh, if you're in Romans 1, the book right before Romans is Acts, and actually the very last chapter in Acts is Acts 28, and Acts 28 tells us what Paul did when he got to Rome. Acts was written well after uh, Romans, and if, you, if you're looking at the headings there in, in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 28, right before verse 11, it says arrival in Rome, and so verse 11 to 16 uh, talks about their arrival to Rome. And then in verse 17, it details what Paul did there when he got to Rome. And it says this, Acts 28, 17, it says, it came to pass after three days that Paul called the leaders of the Jews together. So when they had come together, he said to them, men and brethren, though I've done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of of the Romans. And then he details exactly what happened so they would understand how he came to Rome and that he would be able to tell the, 
the truth and that they wouldn't just believe what other people said about Paul, that they would hear it from his own, his own voice. And then, uh, and then they respond in verse 21. Uh, we neither received letters from Judea concerning you, nor have any of the brethren who came reported or spoken any evil of you. But we want to hear what you think uh, concerning uh, this sect, meaning Christianity. We know that it's spoken against everywhere. So he's talking to Jews. So these are not necessarily Christians. And it says, uh, so when they had appointed him a day, many came to him at his lodging. And here's what he did. To whom he explained and solemnly testified of the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus from the Old Testament, from the law of Moses and the prophets, from morning until evening. So Paul spent hours and hours every day talking to people about Jesus, talking to the Jews, explaining to the Jews that Jesus was, in fact, the Messiah. Uh, and then verses uh, 24 and following talk about the opposition there uh, and that they did not receive his message. And then if you... Uh, Look at verse 28. It says, Therefore, let it be known to you that the salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will hear it. So Paul went to the Jews first. They rejected him, and so he goes to the Gentiles. It says, When he had said these words, the Jews departed, had a great dispute among themselves. Verse 30, Then Paul dwelt two whole years in his own rented house and received all who came to him. And here's what he did in Rome. Preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no one forbidding him. And so when he says here in, in verse 11, I impart to you some spiritual gift, he's talking about you know, his gift of teaching, just mutual encouragement. Uh, and that's exactly what he did. He preached the gospel. He talked about Jesus. He went into detail about who Jesus is. He did what he said he would do uh, in Romans 1.15 where he said that I want to preach the gospel to you. So how does this look in our lives? It's true, isn't it, that someone else's faith can be an inspiration to you? Uh, you know, you hear a story or you read about a story about a missionary or another Christian that attempted something great for God, and that inspires you, doesn't it? Even when you saw that video about that coffee company where, man, they're doing these great things, and, and they're, they're helping people. And, and I love the statistics because it said, you know, like eight families. You know, it's not like we change the whole world, but we change the whole world for eight families, you know? And, and so this inspires us when we hear about other people's faith because it was their faith that motivated them to do that. And that action then inspires you, inspires me, to do something for God. At least I hope it does. I think it should. Faith should be, not always, but faith should be dynamic. So the, there, there's this great story in the Old Testament. I don't know if you, if you know it, but it's found in, in 1 Samuel chapter 14. Do you know the story about Jonathan and his armor bearer? Uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 14, Jonathan is the son of the king. His dad is the king. His dad's name is Saul. And the, the Israelites, of whom Jonathan is an Israelite, they have enemies. And in the Bible, one of their greatest enemies is the Philistines. Uh, you remember David and Goliath. Goliath was a Philistine. So, uh, so, so Jonathan was at war, and they're against the Philistines. And so Jonathan had his friend, his companion, his armor bearer, the person who helped carry his equipment and whatnot, so Jonathan and his armor bearer are on one side of this mountain. And the Philistine, there's a Philistine camp on the other side with, with a ton of people. And, and Jonathan says in 1 Samuel chapter 14, 6, uh, Jonathan said to his young man who bore his armor, he says, Hey, come on. Let's go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised, of these Philistines. It may be that the Lord will work for us. For nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. So, so Jonathan is saying, as, as another translation says, maybe God's going to do something. Actually, that's not another translation. I just threw that in there. Uh, but <laughs> the other translation says, perhaps the Lord will help us. For nothing can hinder the Lord. He can win a battle, whether he has many warriors or only a few. That's NLT. But it's like Jonathan is saying, hey, come on. What if God wants to do something? Let's just give it a shot. Let's step out. Let's try. 
in the name of God, let's go for it and see what happens. What is that? Faith, right? That's faith. Jonathan had faith. He's like saying, hey, we love the Lord. These people are enemies of God. What if God wants to knock them out and he wants to use us, right? Now, I want you to notice how Jonathan's faith interacts with that of his armor bearer. His armor bearer did not say, Jonathan, really? Come on. Do you really think that the two of us, I mean, there's, I mean, like we're outnumbered like five to one. Jonathan, listen, if God wants to do something, he doesn't need us. I call that a wet blanket. You ever been around a wet blanket? Everything you want to do, everything you want to go for, you get discouraged because somebody brings discouragement. Your faith is interacting. See, they have weak faith, and that diminishes your faith. Instead, his armor bearer said, do all that is in your heart. Go then. I'm going to stick back here and let you. No, he didn't say that. He said, go do what's all in your heart. I'm with you. Go, go then. Here I am. I'm with you. Do all that's in your heart. Do all that's according to your heart. That's encouragement. Their faith is interacting. That encouraged Jonathan's faith. Jonathan's faith encouraged the armor bearers, vice versa. They went over and they saw a great victory. God wiped them out. God wiped out the enemy because of their faith. Pastor Chuck Smith calls this a venture of faith. Taking a venture of faith. It's a fantastic passage. I encourage you to check it out, 1 Samuel chapter 14. All right, so it wasn't just the faith of one man that did that. It was the faith of two men. Our faith is dynamic, isn't it? It can grow. It can decrease. We can have seasons of strong faith. We can have seasons where we're doubting more than we're believing. And our faith can be affected both positively and negatively by the faith or lack thereof of other people, can it? Uh, for example, sometimes we see someone fall away from the Lord, maybe. We see somebody make some bad decisions. We see where maybe God didn't answer a prayer, for example. And then we could have a response of a lack of faith, or we could have a response of discouragement. Now, though I, I'm also opposed, because the Bible is opposed, to this faith that, that says, uh, if you believe hard enough, it can happen no matter what. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like the reason you're sick is because you don't have enough faith? No, 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 no. That's a lie from the pit of hell. All right? So, so we, we walk through trials. And, and in, in a minute, actually, let's do this right now. You see, because our faith is like a muscle, right? The more you use it, the stronger it gets. If you don't use it, what happens, right? It atrophies, right? It, it, it's, um, it, it becomes harder than to use in the future. So let's, let's answer the question then, how does our faith grow? How does our faith increase? It's a good question, isn't it? Because your faith can grow. It's dynamic. It can, it, it can increase. So what do we do if we find ourselves with a weak faith or even non-existence? We've already talked about this a little bit. But I want to give you five ways that our faith can grow. I want to jot these down. Number one, others. Or that could be fellowship. Our faith grows when we hang out with people who have stronger faith than we have, right? We've already mentioned this. The faith of others can amplify our own faith. So surround yourselves with people who, to young people, I always say this, find people that you want to be like and hang out with them, right? So if we surround ourselves with people, excuse me, if we surround ourselves with people who are strong in faith, our faith is going to grow. All right, number two, is prayer. We've already mentioned this. There's a very tight relationship between prayer and faith. The more you pray, the more your faith will grow. Number three, the Word of God. Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So as you, as you spend time in this book, as you read this book, even now as you're sitting hearing hearing the exposition of the Word of God, if everything's going the way it should, your faith should be becoming stronger. You should leave here stronger, closer to the Lord. Isn't that why we come? One of the reasons why we come to church. 
All right, here's another one that I know many of you know far better than I do, uh, and that is trials. Trials, difficulty, suffering, tough times. Your faith grows through tough times. And this is not, this is not something that's a new revelation to the church. Uh, Chrysostom, who was the bishop of Constantinople in the 4th century, wrote about this. Let me read this quote. Uh, it says, And you say, how can faith increase? It does so when we suffer something horrible for the sake of faith. It is a great thing for faith to be solidly established and not be carried away by some sophistry. But when the winds assail us, when the rains burst upon us, when a violent storm is raised on every side and the waves follow upon one another, that fact that we are not shaken is a proof that faith grows, grows abundantly and becomes more exalted. And so your trials that you go through, if you meet them with perseverance, your faith is going to grow. I think this is one of the reasons why God brings suffering into our lives, to make us stronger and deeper. I mean, you, you show me somebody that's never gone through suffering or difficulty. First of all, it's going to be hard for you to find somebody like that. But let's just say you do, and I'll show you somebody that's weak in character. Because it's the, it's, it's, it's the scourge of suffering that develops this depth of character, this, this faithfulness that you can't get any other way. 